So today we have uh, uh, with us uh, uh, Professor uh, Peter Bursha from uh, MIT. Uh, professor Bursha is the Francis Friedman Professor. Um, he did his undergraduate and uh, PhD at UCL in London in 1964. And then after that he joined the MIT and he's been at MIT since, uh, since 1969. Um, <coughs> He has worked in uh, multiple experiments at Fermilab and, and then the, uh, the BNL in uh, with Falls, where he was the spokesman uh, for many years. And then more recently, he joined uh, the, the CMS experiments, working in uh, heavy ions. So today, uh, um, we uh, he will uh, discuss uh, historical perspective uh, about these multi-particle interactions and uh, production and heavy ion collisions. Um, and so we are happy to have him here in the Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, let's get started. If today you flew over the boundary between Geneva and uh, between France and Switzerland near Geneva, and if you could see 100 or 200 meters underground, what you would see is a 27 kilometer tunnel. Inside this tunnel, there is uh, about 10,000 magnets, superconducting magnets of a Tesla, which form an accelerator. And the one of the numbers always amazes me, and that's a point out, to make these magnets, one needs superconducting filaments. You won't believe how many you need for this. With this, those filaments, you could go to the sun and back 10 times. It's a mind-boggling thought, but that's what is involved. So that, inside those magnets, there are vacuum tubes and particles accelerated, normally protons. And in four locations, there are some big massive detectors for seeing the products of the collisions. Again, there I'm just showing one of the devices, the one most familiar to you here, since many of, there are several of you here working uh, with it. But the mass of this one device exceeds the mass of the Eiffel Tower. You want me, it's not loud enough. You want me to speak louder? OK, I'll speak louder. And that's not enough, I'll put the mic on. OK, I'll try to speak louder in that case. So I will continue imagining what you would see if you were there. First of all, I just want to bring the attention to bring that device into reality to build it cost close to $10 billion. It was primarily built for studying proton with proton collisions. But the uh, people interested in collisions of heavy ions get about 10% per year. Now, I now continue discussing, let's assume you had the capability of visualizing the collision of two lead nuclei head on in, one of the, in the middle of one of these detectors. And I'm assuming you can see instantaneously what's going on. All right? What would you see? Well, first of all, remember that the velocity of these nuclei is ultra relativistic. It's like 0.79 beta is 0.99997 of them. And so these nuclei are highly Lorentz contracted. I've exaggerated the width of these. So you have two objects coming extremely contracted. Inside it, there are still nucleons, all 
extremely thin. Inside the nucleons, there are the quarks, and they inter they act through the strong force, through the exchange of gluons with each other. The quarks are colored, the sources of the color fields. When everything is constructed like this, all the fields are transverse. So with this object coming along here, I haven't started moving it yet, it's this thin layer of quarks inside nucleons, nucleons inside the nucleus, and transverse colored fields. It's very important to realize, to have a good picture of what's going on. And so they approach each other. They act, what am I, something's gone. They cross, and I'll stop here for a second. So they come and they cross. Remember the time, the clocks are incredibly time dilated. Nothing moves relative to each other. So they go through each other. Everything doesn't, the only thing that has a chance of interacting are the colored fields. Because unlike the electromagnetic field, the colored field is colored by itself. So they interact. So as these two objects, go through each other, the colored fields entangle with each other. And not in the sense of quantum mechanical entanglement, I mean more like wires or strings get tangled up, all right? They go, so what you have immediately afterwards, as they've gone past, between these sheets, which haven't changed in this process, a strong the longitudinal field, the transverse color field, has flipped and has become longitudinal. That field exerts a force on the, these two sheets. All right? And so they slow down. But you wouldn't notice it because all that's happened, the velocity has changed from 0.79 to point five nines, all right? So the relative location, everything hasn't changed except uh, of that. All right, so they've passed, and the distance in between, the blue parts is, the rem is those passing sheets of nuclear matter. In between is the vacuum, normal vacuum. But this vacuum now sits in a longitudinal field. Now, unlike what people thought even 20 or 30 years ago, our understanding of nature has significantly changed. And today, we, the, we imagine the vacuum to be something extremely dynamic. It's not nothingness. All the time you have pairs of electron-positrons appearing, or quark-anti-quark -quark appearing, and once they violate the uncertainty principle, they collapse again and disappear. But it's a highly dynamic uh, system. And if you want to get a better description of it, Wilczek wrote a book recently, a whole book basically describing this vacuum. It's a very dynamic system. Now, look at that region between those sheets. It's in red here. You have it now a longitudinal field. If a Q, Q bar pops up from the vacuum, as it does, suddenly it finds itself in a very strong field, tears it apart. So any Q, Q, Q bar pair that appears gets torn to shreds thereby that, and has no chance to, to satisfy the uncertainty principle and go back and disappear. And so as these two systems go by, this vacuum literally gets heated directly. 
and gets hotter and hotter as the system goes on. All right, so this system then continues moving. Let me, where is this? Okay. I'm having, okay. Let me stop for a second. You've got to remember this is relativity, all right? So as these two systems separate, all right, the, the only changes in the matter is right initially right in the middle where the fields are pulling in the opposite directions and you start getting QQ bar pairs there large collection of them, and they will start now looking for each other because they are colored and start forming hadrons. So hadrons start forming somewhere in the middle, all right, out of this boiled vacuum. In the way I like to see it, I mean, this is a very, very hot uh, system. It gradually expands. And as it expands, it cools. And this cooled system forms droplets of hadrons. In the front and back, nothing changes because now the, f the, the, uh, the sheets of nucleons still has the attached fields. The clock for them is very slow. They're moving at essentially at almost speed of light. So those sheets drag the field with them. And this continues for a very long distance before the fields start breaking off from the nuclear matter. So as a function of time, OK, we start getting something like this, all right? And this uh, picture doesn't give you, over here, nothing has changed. If you were sitting on this uh, nucleus, all you would see is going away from you is a colored field. Over here, the same, Gra all right? Over here, you've already had time cool the whole system, and particles are produced. So gradually, as time goes on, this system moves, the right to left moves. OK, and I'll stop there and do no more. OK, and then here notice, nothing has changed the sheets of nucleons, with the only exception that the beta of these, this sheet of nuclear, nuclear matter is, is going slightly slower, but you wouldn't know the difference between 0.59s or 7.9s. On the other hand, if you go now into the rest friend of this sheet, there is a colossal difference which, whether you are go we're going at 0.79s, then 0.59s. That corresponds to a massive contraction in size. The, this nuclear matter has been squished by about a factor 5 to 10. All right? And you can, there are two ways to see it if you don't understand how this increase of density comes about. You can imagine like soldiers marching. That's this, those row of nucleons inside that nucleus moving. If it suddenly comes to mud so that you all slow down by s some amount, you automatically compress. Right, and then you continue as a compressed system. So this system is basically a nucleus. This the blue part that you can hardly see is a nucleus compressed about a factor five or ten. We know very little about that system. 
it is very hard to study and we know almost nothing. It's a nucleus compressed by about a factor 5 or 10, enough for the nucleons to grind into each other. Okay? In between the two, gradually you're producing more and more particles. As those, it's, if you imagine it, this looks almost like a jet moving away, and in its tails, particles are coming out and the rocket continues moving, burning, and producing in the back particles. And so it produces these particles, all right? It's very hot. This is what I call a boiling vacuum. Its temperature is about 10 to the 12 degrees Kelvin, okay? But it, it also expands. So it cools, and the moment comes where it's expanded enough and cooled enough that that system of quarks, gluons, can no longer remain as such, and droplets of particles fall. OK. What do you see in the laboratory? You see, and this is now, what your detectors tell you. You see in a typical lead-lead collision at LHC, that accelerator I show you, you can, in central collisions, more than 40,000 particles are produced, and you can see them coming out. These are the ones which were boiled from the vacuum. It's a beautiful example of the conversion of energy into matter. The energy, the kinetic energy that was taken out of the two nuclei as they produced the field between them has been converted into production of particles. And it is the study of these particles that tells us something about the material we've created. N notice, our detectors are, at this time are incapable of telling you anything about those compressed nuclei that went forward and backward because they are moving so fast that their products are all going forward and backward, mainly in the beam pipe. Nobody has studied them. We don't know what is their state other than a good estimate, it is a nucleus, which is compressed by about a factor 5 or 10. Now, everything I've told you, I am almost 100% certain is correct. It is based on 50 years of our studies of particles and nuclear physics, and the use. That not, there is, it isn't very sophisticated the details, it's following special relativity. Okay. So now I face the problem. I have uh, 40 minutes left and I have a choice. I can tell you what is it that we want to learn. I ask the question, why are we boiling the vacuum? That question is ambiguous. It can have two meanings. One is, what is it that we want to learn from studying such collision, and what have we learned to date? All right, that's one meaning of that question. And I will, I've decided not to answer that one, and I'll tell you why. First of all, you had some colloquia on that subject here. Secondly, you have a group over here of faculty, postdoc students who are more up to date than I, and probably can give you a much better explanation what is the current status of the information we've extracted from such data. Go and bug them afterwards, <laughs> or get them to give you talks on the subject. The other meaning of the question is, why are we smashing lead on lead at ultra relativistic velocity? Who came up with such a crazy idea? And let me, and that's the question I'll try to 
That's what I'll address in the remaining 40 minutes. How do we get to it? And let me tell you what, what it is not. It is not that at some moment in the past, some wise guy or group of people sat down and said, wouldn't it be interesting to study the boiling vacuum? Yes, so we will boil the vacuum. How will we do this? We will propose to take nuclei, collide them with each other, produce this hot system, and that will be doing. That is so far from the truth, it's funny. All right? That's not how science progresses. It, we've stumbled onto this almost by accident. All right? And I will try to give you some idea of some of the episodes in the history which resulted in us finally asking that question. And it boils, and I forgive the pun, boils down to the f looking at the history of the studies of PA collisions and AA collisions over a period of 150 years. And for those who think I'm drunk, 150, this is not a typo. OK? The beginning has to, you have to look back all the way to the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, to photography. Some very clever people developed the photographic process. In particular, uh, by the way, many of my transparencies have more words than I'm saying. You don't have to read it. It just helps me to remember what I have to say. So I'll sometimes miss lo lots and just focus. I just want to focus on one particular guy, Niepce de San Victor, an important player in the development of photographic films. In 1867, he took, a, he was interested at the time in luminescence. And he had some uranium salts, and he wanted to see how, how, how they behave after they've been illuminated by strong light. And to give himself time to do the experiment, he wrapped the uranium salts in some black paper, and then, I don't know what made him, but he, l he developed the, n the film that he had nearby, and to his surprise, it was fogged. Now, you, you would be amazed what his reaction was. His reaction, that's strange. Huh, can't think of anything that would do it. Ah, something must be wrong. And he ignored it, all right? Because, and this is the way we behave today. If you are in an environment where there is nothing reasonable that can explain a fact, you've either made a mistake, I mean, there are no ghosts, you know, you just ignore it, all right? This was too early. Go forward, 30 years later, another Frenchman, Becquerel, does essentially the same. He's interested in phosphorescence and luminescence. Of, uh, and he does, again, something similar happens. It also, the weather helped him. He, he didn't, the sun was blocked for a few days, so his salts were not illuminated, etc. But he does exactly the same. He is aware of this guy's uh, observation. This guy at least wrote it down in his notebook. All right? So Becquerel knew about it. OK? So he remembered, yes, th this is interesting. But there is a difference. At the time when Becquerel does th observes this, X-rays have been just discovered by Rentgen. All right, uh, Crook was uh, uh, at this uh, what you call it? Mm, I, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, cathode ray tubes. All right, and the, uh, the possibility of new rays was in the atmosphere. So he does careful experimentation. He tries putting more sheets, less, etc., and of course discovers radioactivity. So in 1903, he, Maria Skłodowska-Curie, and Pierre Curie 
received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of radiation. Poro, Jepsen, yep, and Victor overlooked. Rightly so. He did not follow in any sensible way an incredible observation. But the, uh, Becquerel stops at that. He doesn't make the next step. These are rays. Shouldn't I see tracks of rays in this? So he never studies his exposed film very much. You have to wait another 10 or so years when people start thinking, well, you know, let's put some salts or some radioactive material and see whether we can actually see tracks from these rays. And lo and behold, in 1910, they do. All right? So this is the first two-dimensional four pi detector, if you want. It's right, it's got two pi, not a four pi, two pi. Okay. And see this, and these, this is alpha rays. These emulsions were not yet sensitive enough to minimum ionizing particles. Then comes around 1925, when a brilliant physicist by the name of Marietta Blau, who is then interested in cosmic rays, she decides, she's an Austrian physicist, and she decides she's got to build a 4 pi detector. So she works on producing better emulsions, thicker, 70 microns thick, with different chemical composition to make them more sensitive to minimum ionizing particles. A very hard process. If we now go back, Ilford and Kodak had tremendous problems to reproduce what she did, etc. But she succeeded. And, so, and then in 1937, she flies her emulsions. Oh, I should add something. She works at the Radium Institute in Vienna. Being a woman, she's kindly allowed to have a lab in the corridor. She is not, she's not given a laboratory of her own. Right? She has one student, all right, by the name uh, Van Baher. But their genius and ability are more important than lab, than lab space. She develops these, sends balloons up, exposes them, and discovers the first PA collision. What she finds in her emulsion, this is it, at this location. And if you look carefully with a microscope and study the tr all these tracks, these are grains of silver that you can follow, she sees an explosion. To cut the story, it's complicated. At first she thinks it may be a different uh, a nuclear material, it's nothing to do with cosmic rays. She continues, looks more, finds more of these stars, <coughs> and conclusively shows this is the result of protons hitting a nucleus. It had to be a heavy nucleus, silver or bromine, to produce such stars. All right? She's a great physicist. She immediately wants to study how, what is the mechanism whereby a proton hitting a nucleus blows it into a star like that. So what do you do? You repeat it with different nuclei. Now, you she couldn't change the emulsions, and so she produced a stack of emulsions with sheets of different elements in between. Flies them in a balloon, obtains her data, right? She is on top of the world as far as prestige in this field. But what happens? March 1938. Nazis enter Austria. Her student, Van Bacher, joins the Nazi party, right? 
She has no choice but to run. She gets on a Zeppelin, takes with her her notes and her plates, but on, on her way to Oslo. On the way, the Zeppelin has to refuel, stops. Gestapo enter the cabin. Leave her alone. This is 38. They are not exterminating Jews yet. But grab all her scientific material. There's no evidence why, but there's a indirect evidence that it's her student. The Nazi party m member wanted those for her research. Unfortunately, and I don't have time to go, she has a tragic life. She has, tries to save her mother, ends up in Mexico, the United States, but her career is destroyed. None other than Erwin Schrodinger proposes her for the Nobel Prize. She's a woman, a refugee, and nobody. Of course, it's denied. This is 1937. 37. Sorry, this is 1937. And by the way, this is interesting in itself. From here to here is a complete letter. Those days, <laughs> physical review letters meant letters. In the nature, a letter meant a letter. This is it. All right, you didn't have to go through reviewers and 200 pages of references, etc. So she's after Fermi, publishes Fisher. Yes, right? yes. Okay, so, so this is not the first example it's of the first It's the first observa direct observation yeah. of a proton hitting a nucleus, blowing it up okay. into fragments, OK? So I continue on this story. In 1947, Powell in England <coughs> knows about her work, has strong funding from the government, builds on it, produces better emulsions, almost a factory, has a group on the style of modern day high energy research groups, many people, etc., and flows his emulsions, discovers mesons, gets the Nobel Prize. Between 1947 and today, the nuclear emulsion technique continues, all right? Here is an example of an uh, event in the nuclear emulsion in 1983. Very close in energy in what we are doing today at the LHC. This is 4 TV per nucleon collision. It's not lead on lead, but silicon on silver bromide, 10,000 projects. This is just illustration. So after once the emulsion technique got established, most of the emulsion physicists divided into two groups. The high energy ones looked for things like strange particles, etc., while others were more interested in the phenomenology. What sort of phenomena occur when a um, proton or a nucleus goes through a nuclear emulsion? Okay. I'll come back to some of that later. Okay. I won't go into detail. I'm looking at the clock. Let me just tell you the main surprise that, no, let me go back, not go that far. The main question of interest for the, these, the, the, the group that were just studying the phenomenology was what is the mechanism of production of particles and breakup? 
And the big surprise for them was they see that the multiparticle production of PP and PA is very similar. There are no big differences. In other words, that there is no intranuclear cascading, which you would expect naively if you forgot about special relativity. OK? Then let me tell you, people all forgot about special relativity until about 1975. At the same time as Marietta Blau was, was uh, uh, running around the world trying to find a new life, there were other technologies in use. In particular, there were the Wilson cloud chamber had been invented. And it was mainly invented for the study of cosmic rays. And something I find incredibly interesting because it shows that some of our thinking today is not that original. You can go back and you can see the great minds be way ahead of us. Around 1939, in, a cl in cloud chambers, people started seeing following events. A, in the cosmic rays, few parallel tracks, almost parallel tracks, obviously coming from a single point somewhere in atmosphere. And there was a concern because people like Heidler, Heisenberg, etc., understood how particles are produced. They're produced by radiation, like the Weizsäcker Williams uh, picture. Where, uh, you, and it's, and you can, but you only radiate one particle. So it's OK to have one particle coming in and two coming out. That's OK. But they started seeing situations where more than two were coming in, were coming out. And this bothered them. There's an exchange of letters. It's, uh, you can, I, I looked at it. Between Heitler and Heisenberg, characters you've all heard of, all right? This is not any Tom, Dick, and Harry, all right? And they are arguing in public whether you can really get more than one particle produced. And Heitler con is convinced, no, you cannot. And then comes a guy by the, the name of Yanoshi and also some other people who solved the problem. So, yeah. We are being misled. If I look carefully at my pictures, all the cases where there are more than two particles come from sheets of lead or iron or something. So it is not in a PP producing more than thing. What we are seeing is intranuclear cascading. What's happening, a proton comes along, hits the lead, and cascades the particle production. Uh, uh, if they thought about relativity, they would have not, even these great minds would have missed that one, but that there is not enough time for it. But still, they, they're just cascading. Peace. Until 1947. Because in 1947, what happens? This is the kind of thing I was talking about, p lead collision. This many particles coming from somewhere in there. This happened to be a lead plate. But then Powell's group, in their super emulsions, sees PP collision producing many particles. All right? So there must be some other mechanism that gives rise to that. OK? And what is interesting at this time in the history, the theories seem to have gone on their own thinking. The experimenters went on their own. I don't think they talked much with each other. There's no evidence there's much communication or influence one on the other. So let's see what. The, 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 some serious the, uh, uh, theorists was, were interested in this fact that you produce uh, this production of particles. All right? So I want to point out this is a serious question how particles are produced. Okay? And for example, uh, Oppenheimer and company thinks what happens is in, that there are intense fields. It doesn't say what, which readjust into mesons. And if you listen carefully, there's a lot you'll hear there 
that we are taught, especially if you work in this field, that you hear now people speaking. All right, so it's uh, not everything nowadays we do is that original. Uh, Heisenberg is convinced that the PP produces a meson field and it's turbulent in that field which produces particles. Fermi doesn't buy any of this. He's convinced that the strong force is so bloody strong that when a proton hits a proton, it actually comes to a halt, all right? The f if you calculate the force, it's astronomical force if you want to stop these objects. But that's what he thinks happens. A very hot stationary system is produced. He believes in the classical thermodynamics, calculates what will happen if such a hot system uh, expands and produces particles and gets roughly the right answer. That's the amazing thing, OK, of what one is seeing. It has, it has one problem. It is spherically symmetric, while data shows that the p-perp is limited. It's a longitudinal thing. So Landau comes up with a similar model, except at first some material or something is produced, which ex expands according to relativistic hydrodynamics. Some of you in the field may recognize these words. And only then they decay into particles. And that the expansion is not isotropic, and there's a limited to PT. Some other characters more closer to the data come up with all sorts of models of two, two fireballs, etc. I won't. OK. So with that background, we reach the early 70s, which I like uh, from the point of view of PA and AA studies are extremely e uh, dynamic, exciting. A lot of things that goes on. But there are two communities get formed that do talk to each other, but not too much. We, we, I was already in one of these, and we did have common meetings. But at the meetings, you almost felt there were two sets of lectures, the, those with a high energy background and those with a nuclear background. All right? So uh, not too much cross-fertilization. Okay. So let me start with the community with the high energy background. The questions we were interested in, and I can use now we because I was already a postdoc at that time and later an assistant professor. We were interested in how our particles produce. Why so little intranuclear cascading? Why PP and PAs? Series, based on what we heard from before. But in addition, we were really interested in the following question. If you have a PP collision and you produce 10 or 20 particles, you know those particles cannot be on top of each other at the time of production. It makes no sense. There's no room. So after the production, the initial collision, there must have been a period when some material or something was formed before that decayed into the final particles. And the question is, what is that material? That bothered us. Okay? And the other thing is, influenced by some theories, we started thinking about in these collisions taking into account special relativity. And a lot of the simple facts were explainable simply by Lorentz contraction, time dilation, etc. So some ev phenomena, which seems crazy, were simple to understand. Uh, I have to move faster, so I'll uh, miss some other things. I'll now spend a few minutes tell you from my own experience. At this time, I got interested in this kind of physics. And I'll just tell you quickly the kind of things I was involved in. All right? The first thing I was as a postdoc, I go, was involved in an experiment ver which is very similar to what your colleagues are now doing at LHC. We were interested in the photoproduction of rho mesons, in other words, a beam of photons um, and uh, hitting a target, producing a rho meson which decays. 
today it may seem funny, but the question we wanted to answer was, was the rho meson a, like a molecule of two pi's, or was it a, s a single particle? So we wanted to measure the cross-section of this rho meson, which only lift, li, 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 lived for about 10 to the minus 22 of a second or something, measured size. And we, one can do it by studying the coherent productions of rows of nu on nuclei. I don't have time to explain it, but it's exactly what your colleagues are doing now, looking at JPSI, and they can explain it to you very nicely. And we, of course, found that the roll is basically the same size as the pi. It's not a molecule. Thing. But because of my interest of using nuclei for the study of high energy phenomena, I was very interested in a seminar given at MIT by Larry Jones from Michigan. He's still alive, I believe. He's, he's, he's he a seminar here. Is he giving a seminar? I gave a few years ago. Oh, he gave one a few years okay. ago. OK. He's not given enough credit for this, all right? He did the Blau experiment on top in the Colorado in Echo Lake, except like Marietta Blau wanted or did and had the material before it was stolen from her, did it with emulsions and metal plates. Larry Jones had metal plates and he had spark chambers, all right? And he looked how multiple production of particles depended on the nuclei. And he observed qu quantitatively, because okay, he knew the actual nuclei that were being actually hit, he did observe that there is not much cascading taking place. For reasons that I do not understand, he didn't follow this very up. Lucky for me. All right, I was an assistant professor. I desperately wanted to do something by myself. I got hold of one student, and we did the one, an experiment at Fermi with one faculty and one student at Fermi Lab with the accelerator. For shifts, we had hired hands. Friends would come and help us take data days and nights. Okay? so. This, just to give you how times have changed, this I Xerox from the real Fermilab proposal that I wrote in 1972. It was hand drawn and accepted, and I got approval by the lab, all right? I won't discuss the experiment, I don't have time, all right? But let me tell you what we found. And I'm telling you, I'm very proud of it. It gave me tenure at MIT. Very important fact, all right, as you will appreciate. And, but those in the field will be surprised. It's the following. The question was, is there, how if the, is the, the question is the following. Is the mechanism the following? You have a proton hitting the first nucleon of a nucleus, producing some fragments. And these fragments hit the next, etc. Or is it more like the proton comes in, hit the first one, gets a nasty hit, it sort of wiggles and like a, a drop wobbles around, hits the next one, that changes the motion. But basically, it comes out as if it hit one object. That's what we were trying to answer. And so we were trying to measure, as you change the thickness of the nucleus, how the number of particles changes. Right? Now, today, every new, uh, high end, uh, heavy ion physicist will tell you, of course, it goes like the number of nucleons that hit something, what they're called participants. Well, let me tell you, in those days, nobody thought it would go like the number of participants. All right? There were all sorts of theories. It, one, this was completely crazy idea. We found it goes like the number of participants. Today, everybody uses the term number of participants, assuming it's God-given. It's so obvious. That's the only way it could go. And today, it's still not understood why it goes like that. Okay, it's an interesting fact. 
Everybody uses it. It's obvious. You don't even have to explain it. But, and th this was the discovery of participant scaling. I don't have enough time to tell you about the various theories and models that were produced as a result of the, our data, but I have a file with a thousand preprints, okay? And there were, every, people were struggling to come up, and the new thing that was coming up was the appreciation that in these, th there must be some gradual gener g evolution of from the point, from the moment of collision to the final production, some new material must be formed. It, uh, there was a very nice model, also forgotten by now, by K uh, Kurt Gottfried. He called it the energy cascade model. Uh, this energy nowadays one would call the core gluon plasma, probably. But anyway, I don't have enough time. I, I must move on. But there was a lot of activities. And one more thing that came out of this, which is important for what I'll say in a second, what we, we actually measured how much stopping there is of the proton which goes through the nucleus. And we were thrilled because it came right in the right ballpark to make it useful if you study go heavy ion collisions that you'll get See, it could be a complete bus. You have two nuclei going, and they'll go through each other. Bingo, nothing interesting happened. You've wasted $10 billion, right? Or it could be stop, a la Fermi and Landau. But no, it's in between. In a typical proton nucleus collision, the proton loses about 85% of its energy. It loses two units of rapidity for the, those. And it showed that it's in a, a regime where we, it'll be useful to do such studies. Now I switch to the other community. Okay? At this, as the, the, this, that was the high energy one. The nuclear theorists, after 1970, get <coughs> interested in physics other than directly related to nuclear theory, you know, to the structure of the nucleus, etc. It's driven by both theoretical and experimental work. The neutron star gets, was discovered in 67. Um, uh, beams at Berkeley, heavy iron beams became available, so people started studying how a nucleus sits in other, nu what compression of nuclear matter you get. They got interested in equation of state of nuclear matter, etc. And they even, and they start thinking about the possibilities of completely different forms of nuclear matter and even of abnormal states of the vacuum. Okay? In 1974, a very important meeting takes place at Bear Mountain in New York, to which about 50 leaders of the world in the world, nuclear experimenters, theorists, particle experimenters, theorists, and accelerator people, to discuss what future is, uh, interests are there in issues like co uh, compressed nuclear matter, different nuclear, Basic to, to address this kind of question. Okay? What is amazing, and the memory of those who have been there sometimes fails, I've read the proceedings. There is a no mention of quark matter, of quark gluons. So this is 1974, five years after deep inelastic scattering at Slack. All right? So the concern here is purely nuclear matter. This addresses the question of what happens to those disks I told you at the beginning, about which we still don't know very much. What is it if you compress nuclear matter by factor 5 or 10, etc.? OK? 
OK? But at the same year, and under, presumably not a w these people weren't fully aware of it, there was asymptotic freedom, well understood, and more important, Kenny Johnson, and one of the most unappreciated genii, as far as I'm concerned, comes up with the uh, MIT bag model, all right? And this has a dramatic effect on the community. Suddenly, when they were talking about compressed nuclear matter, they, re they started talking about maybe we should take into account the quarks and gluons. And for example, a guy, by the, uh, two guys, Collins and Perry, for the first time, write, this is 1975, the, it would be an interesting system if you took a very high density of quarks and gluons so that because of asymptotic freedom, they don't interact strongly, so they act weakly, it would be an interesting gas. They call it a quark-gluon soup. Okay? Uh, and then a few years later, Shuriak co co comes with the name quark-gluon plasma. Okay. So, we now are in the following situation. We have some high energy physicists interested in the material formed in the collision between particles. You have nuclear physicists in interested in compressed nuclear matter. Both begin to talk the same language. And at the same time, lab directors have problems. What do we do with our accelerators? All right? And so let, so let me now switch gears and talk about what's happening on the accelerator front in the 1970s, early 80s. At Berkeley, the Bevatron, the Bevatron has magnificent machine has run out of things to do. It's too low an energy. It's been bypassed. That's the Bevatron. Up in the mountains, this is Berkeley, they have the, a linear accelerator, which they beefed up to, which they call originally was a high like a super high like with, in which they can accelerate every element that is stable. And some guy said, you know, why don't we take this as the input to this, and then shoot into here. You want me to switch off? Five minutes, all right? And with those who have to bus to catch, go, all right? And so they have this, uh, they pr produce the Bevelac. They use it for scattering, studying collisions of nuclei with nuclei up to 2 GeV. And they're interested in questions like compressing of nuclear matter. Whatever they will tell you today, they remember. I was there, and I n spoke with them, and I heard them talking. They were interested in nuclear matter. But it was a very, this Bevelac attracted a lot of very excited dynamic physicists, many from Germany, and who, in their excitement, got others interested in this question, all right? And on another front, I'll leave this for a second, I'll come back to that. On another front, Brookhaven has a problem. They propose in 72 a proton-proton colliding beam accelerator, Isabel. Then, because of progress in particle physics, they increased it to 400 and 400. By 78, it's approved, all right? But two terrible things happen for them. One, they have trouble making the magnets. And so the community starts getting jittery and loses faith in them, all right? They, they, uh, they would have succeeded. They were close to succeeding. But then the high energy physicists think big. They said, let's build the desertron. 
let's go to the Arizona desert and let's build an accelerator, 20 TV on 20 TV, etc. And its future turned into SSC, all right? And they convince the community, let's save money. These guys can't make the magnets, let's kill the Isabel project and build the SSC, okay? But Brookhaven, the brilliant director, Sanyos, he smelled the rat. So officially, he was selling his Isabel project, saying his magnets are almost done. And on the quiet, had a group working on how to make this useful to this excited nuclear physicist in Berkeley. OK? And on the day, July 11, 1983, when the uh, DOE, etc., cetera, kill Isabel, Samuels has an all-hands meeting at Brookhaven. We are building a rick. OK? So that's how Rick came on the scene. So then we come to the 80s, which I like to say the rush for gold. At the nuclear physics community at this time, as I say, had the vision based on their experience at the Bevelac. What happens is you have two nuclei will come. They will smash into each other, and they'll produce this dense nuclear matter, which will also have quark degrees. If it's hot enough, we'll have quark degrees of freedom, all right? And th this is how this newly coined quark gluon plasma will show up. We need to, to build AA colliders to do this. The high energy people still didn't make sense of this. It violated special relativity, and they were, but they were still interested in heavy ion collisions because they will help to untangle how particles are produced. And uh, they had a little bit of hope for this exciting the vacuum. OK. And what happens to go? So gradually, all the labs who want to rescue their personnel and the lab convert to heavy ion accelerators. AGS, between 1986 and 1990, it goes, becomes a heavy ion collider. The SPS becomes a heavy ion uh, collider. The RIC comes on the air, and then, of course, the LHC. The one accelerator who doesn't, that does not join the bandwagon is the ISR at CERN. The ISR, the physicists were purists. These damn nuclear physicists don't know what they're talking about. It's a waste of money. Let's save our money and get lap on the air quicker. So they, if they had gone, this is a 30 GV on 30 GV. If they put lead on lead there, Rick would have been wiped out. Because for a quarter of the money or a tenth of the money, they would have produced Rick. But they decided, no let them hang themselves at Brookhaven, and we will bring, use those funds for lead. So ISR got shut, and the money went to that. OK, almost the end, so I will finish in two minutes. So now the situation is the following. You've got accelerators everywhere. The community has got convinced, all sides, for different reasons that there will be this exciting matter. If you take nuclei and you compress them, you produce uh, quarks and gluon close to the other, and you produce the QGP. Uh, the high energy people thought they'll, these things, particles will go past each other, but they will heat the vacuum and they will produce the QGP. It's such a sexy thing, QGP. There's a Nobel Prize in it. Race for that. Everybody wanted to do it. OK? And, of and then the problem was things didn't look so, as, uh, so easy, all right? And so each lab, when it saw the next lab going to a slightly higher energy, said, we've got to declare victory. So you have a press conference, CERN, in February 2000, new state of matter created at CERN, all right? Whatever they saw, 
it was really interesting. It had nothing to do with the QGP, but it was interesting, okay? Then at Brookhaven, 2005, scientists set up perfect liquid, all right? Now, here we were slimy, all right? Because we, did, we knew this was not the QGP, all right? But we couldn't admit it, because after all, DOE gave us money to find the QGP, all right? And this stuff had interesting properties, and so we called it the perfect liquid, because it had liquid-like properties, flowed, etc. Okay? And so, what is the situation? Well, to date, no weakly interacting quark gluon plasma has been observed. That is a fact. We now know why. The energy is too low. We cannot get, if you look at the, uh, as a, uh, what you call it, the running constant, you need to go miles down that curve before the interaction is weakly. You need a million times this kind of energy, all right? So the QGP is not there, so we haven't found it, all right? But we found something much more interesting. Because had we found the QGP, where would we go next? Weakly interacting gas, what do you do with it, all <laughs> right? But instead, we found a strongly interacting system, OK? And, but then, to placate the founding engine, uh, the newspapers, and the DOE, etc., what we did, we declared victory. We def redefined QGP. QGP is that system which we create at the highest energies with uh, heavy ion collisions. All right? And now I am at the f my final transparency, the first one. Oops, so one. Oh, sorry. I just one more. Give me one more minute, all right? <laughs> the, OK, I'll, I'll just quickly. Uh, You're yes. like uh, Stan Broski now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> then I quit. Then I quit. <laughs> okay, then I quit. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, look, uh, I will summarize. Where are we today is where I told you at the beginning. What is actually happening is, gone by this history, we produce these high energy accelerators. They produce both states, the state which the nuclear physicists want it, and what the high energy guys, all right? Uh, and what, as I was saying at the beginning, when these two nuclei go by, the state that originally the nuclear physicists wanted do get created, but they're very hard to study. The ones, the, the, va the boiling vacuum turns out to be much more interesting than anybody expected. It really behaves like some kind of a fluid, it, has f it flows, it, and it has dramatic uh, properties. You know, if Feynman was alive, he would be shocked. He, he was convinced that a high energy quark goes through matter easily. Well, in these collisions, in this uh, hot vacuum, you see quark, quark collisions at very high energy, scattering said 90 degrees, one quark comes out, the other one disappears. Why? Because it stopped or slowed down in this material, which nobody expected. So there's it, a very interesting medium has been formed, and I think it, the history will be continue to be interesting. And the real question, you will have to find out what it should be in the future. Thank you. <laughs>